。我们接下来来看下一个，是这个 Chris Anderson。Chris Anderson， 我想各位都。相当的认识，不应该有人会不认识。我们用了 TED 这么多东西，这是他在今年的 TED 他谈的一个题目 ：How Web Video Powers Global Innovation， 就是说网络上的影片怎么样子把这个全球化的这个创创造力或者是创意，把它这个整个的这个呃，让它发挥起力量来。那么为什么要跟各位分享这个影片呢？这个影片是他在二零零二年的时候开始接接办了这个 TED。那么现在二零一零年，就是这过去的八年，当然 TED 是一个很长的历史，但是原来他不是创办人，他把他接过来以后，他开始让他变成是一个全球化的东西。他为什么让他能够变成全球化？本来只是一个。只是一个比较小规模的东西呢，是因为他曾经是一个新闻工作者，他曾经也是一个发那个做出版的人。那当他接下来这个的时候呢，他希望把它变成是一个平台，这个平台呢能够去发现，同时呢能够去散播这个 ideas， 能够啊、呃、值得去把它散开来的。那么他接的时间刚好二零零二年，就是差不多网络已经开始在变成是一个呃相当呃快速变成可以让大家容易看到影片了，所以他把它变成影片。他今天在影片里面他会告诉我们，网络变成影片到底有哪一些呃好处。那么我们来看一下，他讲的非常非常的清楚。At least I've discovered what it is we put our speakers through: <laughs> sweaty palms, sleepless nights, a wholly unnatural fear of clocks. I mean, it's it's quite brutal.、Um, and I'm also a little nervous about this. There are nine billion humans coming our way. Now, the most optimistic dreams can get dented by the prospect of people plundering the planet. But recently. I've become intrigued by a different way of thinking of large human crowds, because there are circumstances where they can do something really cool. It's a phenomenon that I think any organisation、uh, or individual can tap into. It certainly impacted the way we think about TED's future and perhaps the world's future overall. So let's explore. The story starts with just a single person, a, a child, behaving a little strangely. This kid's known online as a little demon. Um, he's doing tricks here, dance tricks that probably no six-year-old in history ever managed before. How did he learn them? And what drove him to spend the hundreds of hours of practice this must have taken? Here's a clue. Step your game up, oh! Step your game up, oh! <laughs> so that was sent me by this man, a filmmaker, Jonathan Chu. Who told me that was the moment he realised the internet was causing dance to evolve? This is what he said at TED in February. I mean, in essence, dancers were challenging each other online to get better. Incredible new dance skills were being invented. Even the six-year-olds were joining in. I mean, it felt like a revolution. And so John had a brilliant idea. He went out to recruit the best of the best dancers off of YouTube to create. This dance troupe, the League of Extraordinary Dancers, the LXD. I mean, these kids were web taught, but they were so good they got to play the Oscars this year. And、uh, at TED here in February, their passion and brilliance just took our breath away. So, this story of the evolution of dance seems strangely familiar. You know, a while after TED Talk started taking off, we noticed that speakers were starting to spend a lot more time in preparation. <laughs> It was resulting in incredible new talks like these two, months of preparation crammed into 18 minutes, raising the bar cruelly for the next generation of speakers. With the effects that we've seen this week, and it's not as if JJ and Jill actually ended their talk saying, "Step your game up." Here, I'll stop and take a break. 
。前面这一段他要讲的意思，我想各位很清楚。但是我们把他的重点说出来，意思是说，如果你只是在一个课堂上讲话，那么你的努力就是这个课堂上的努力。如果你只是在少数人的面前跳舞，你的努力就是对着少数人你做的努力。可是如果你像刚刚的那个小孩一样，他把他的舞技，他知道要放到网络上去，如果他也知道有多少人可能看到，可能促使他的进步的力量是大的不得了，那个是一个非常重要的讯息，也就是。我们都看到的那个那个左脑中风的那位神经科学家，他的那个演讲，在网络上会变成那么那么多人看的原因，他刚刚已经说清楚，他要讲那个十八分钟，他要好几个月的准备，不然他会东一句西一句，东一句西一句，到最后就变成不精彩。所以这一个东西的为什么会成型，是并不是因为这一群人。而是这一群人共同的让这个这个事件可以变成是一个全球性的东西，所以当有人开始讲到这么好的时候，下一下一个年度的人就会讲得更好，就会讲得更好，就会讲得更好。那当他更好的时候，就有更多人来；当他有更多人来的时候，他就让他更好。所以待会儿他会往下讲的时候，就说这个是一个自然转动的一个一个能量，没有人在 push， 他只做了一件事。开放出来，他只要把它开放出去，这个能量就自己开始转，自己开始转。你只要告诉小孩说，你的这个影片会放到网络上面去，让全世界人都看到的时候，他的舞就会越跳越好，越跳越好。这个就是一个主要的一个概念。But they might as well have. So in both of these cases, you've got these cycles of improvement, apparently driven by people watching web video. What is going on here? Well, I think it's the latest iteration of a phenomenon we can call crowd-accelerated innovation. And there are just three things you need for this thing to kick into gear. You could think of them as three dials on a giant wheel. You turn up the dials, the wheel starts to turn. And the first thing you need is a crowd, a group of people who share a common interest. The bigger the crowd, the more potential innovators there are. That's important. But actually, most people in the crowd occupy these other roles. They're creating the ecosystem from which innovation emerges. The second thing you need is light. You need clear, open visibility of what the best people in that crowd are capable of, because that is how you will learn, how you will be empowered to participate. And third, you need desire. You know, innovation's hard work. It's based on hundreds of hours of research, of practice, absent desire, not going to happen. Now, here's an example, pre-internet, of this machine in action. Dancers at a street corner, you know, it's a crowd, a small one, but they can all obviously see what each other can do. And the desire part comes, I guess, from social status, right? Best dancer walks tall, gets the best date. There's probably going to be some innovation happening here. But on the web, all three dials are ratcheted right up. The dance community is now global. There's millions connected. And amazingly, you can still see what the best can do. Because the crowd itself shines a light on them, either directly through comments, ratings, email, Facebook, Twitter, you know, or indirectly through numbers of views, uh, through links that point Google there. So it's easy to find the good stuff. And when you found it, you can watch it in close-up repeatedly and read what hundreds of people have written about it. That's a lot of light. But the desire element is really you know, dialed way up. I mean, you might just be a kid with a webcam, but if you can do something that goes viral, you get to be seen by the equivalent of sports stadiums crammed with people. You get hundreds of strangers writing excitedly about you. And even if it's not that eloquent, and it's not, it can still really make your day. So this possibility of a new type of global recognition, I think is driving huge amounts of effort. And it's important to note that it's not just the stars who are benefiting. Because you can see the best, everyone can learn. Also, the system is self-fueling. 
You know, it's the crowd that shines the light and fuels the desire. But the light and desire are a lethal one-two combination that attract new people to the crowd. So this is a model that pretty much any organization could use to try and nurture its own cycle of crowd-accelerated innovation. uh,创意的循环加速,就是我们今天要讲的设计思考,你在现在的这个,这个时代里头,我们怎么样子在拓,的教育,的教育应该怎么做,我们的社会的这个责任应该怎么做,其实都可以从这三个,这个元素去考
，愿望变大，愿望的人多变成光变多，光大以后就是这个愿望会提升，愿望提升以后人会更多，所以他叭叭叭叭叭叭一直转一直转，所以这个是他从二零零六年开放他以后到二零一零年有这么多人去看，那么这个就是他的开放。那接下来他讲的当然就是他开放翻译以后，那个速度也是快的不得了。And thereby making it easier for us to recruit and motivate the next generation of speakers by opening up our translation program, thousands of heroic volunteers, some of them watching online right now, and thank you, have translated our talks into more than 70 languages, thereby tripling our viewership in non-English speaking countries by giving away our TEDx brand. We suddenly have a thousand plus live experiments in the art of spreading ideas, and these organisers—they're seeing each other, they're learning from each other. We are learning from them. We're getting great talks back from them. The wheel is turning. Okay, step back a minute. I mean, it's really not news for me to tell you that innovation emerges out of groups. You know, we've heard that this week. This romantic notion of the lone genius with a eureka moment that changes the world is misleading. Even he said that, and he would know. We're a social species. We spark off each other. It's also not news to say that the internet has accelerated innovation. You know, for the past 15 years, powerful communities have been connecting online, sparking off each other. If you take Programmers, you know, the whole open source movement is a fantastic instance of crowd-accelerated innovation. But what's key here is that the reason these groups have been able to connect is because their work output is of the type that can be easily shared digitally: a picture, a music file, software. And that's why, you know, what I'm excited about, or what I think is underreported. Is the significance of the rise of online video? This is the technology that's going to allow the rest of the world's talents to be shared digitally, thereby launching a whole new cycle of crowd-accelerated innovation. The first few years of the web were pretty much video-free. For this reason, this is the data volume. You use text when the data volume is like this. You use photos when the data volume is like this. 用 video 的时候，这资料量变得这么大，它很像是一个呃小汽车一一辆大卡车，这个根本是一个好大好大的列车，很多节车厢，所以运送起来本来很困难，所以本来 video 没有办法在网络上，那现在 video 变成能够在网络上，他刚刚的一个重点，请大家大家等一下要仔细听，他说我们都低估了这一件事情到网络上面去的。能力？为什么？我先跟各位解释一下他想说的道理。他想说的道理就是说，用文字去说明一件事情，有它的困难度，因为我们人是生来这样子讲话的，是后来你跑得很远，我们互相看不见的时候，我们才用文字。所以，当我们很远之间。还可以面对面的时候，这个事情就变成又回到最早的时候，是我们两个人在面对面把一个事情讲清楚。这件事情会改变整个世界，而且是彻头彻尾的改变。同时，它会改变学术界。为什么？他等一下举一个例子，要写一篇学术报告，写了个半天，累得半死，还不知道怎么讲，讲清楚他那个实验是怎么做出来的。可是他就用一个影片。他就拍他的整个实验，连写半个字都不用，就是那样。那那个就是最清楚的一个概念的说明。所以他认为 video 这件事情能够上网以后，对于整个的文化都会做很大的改变。Video files are huge. The web couldn't handle them, but in the last ten years, bandwidth has exploded a hundredfold. Suddenly, here we are. Humanity watches 80 million hours of YouTube every day. Cisco actually estimates that. Within four years, more than 90% of the web's data will be video. If it's all puppies, porn, and piracy, we're doomed. <laughs> I don't think it will be.、Um, video is high bandwidth for a reason. It packs a huge amount of data, and our brains are uniquely wired to decode it. Here, let me introduce you to Sam Haber. He's a unicyclist. Before YouTube. 
There was no way for him to discover his sport's true potential, because you can't communicate this stuff in words, right? But looking at video clips posted by strangers, a world of possibility opens up for him. Suddenly, he starts to emulate and then to innovate, and a global community of unicyclists discover each other online, inspire each other to greatness. And there are thousands of other examples of this happening, of video-driven evolution of skills, ranging from the, you know, the physical to the artful. And I have to tell you, as a former publisher of hobbyist magazines, I find this strangely beautiful. I mean, there's a lot of passion right here on this screen. But if Rube Goldberg machines and video poetry aren't quite your cup of tea, how about this? Jove is a website that was founded to encourage scientists to publish their peer-reviewed research on video. There's a problem with a traditional scientific paper. It can take months for a scientist in another lab to figure out how to replicate the experiments that are described in print. Here's one such frustrated scientist, Moshe Pritzker, the founder of Jove. He told me that the world's wasting billions of dollars on this. But look at this video. I mean, look, if you can show, as, instead of just describing, that problem goes away. So it's not far-fetched to say that at some point, online video is going to dramatically accelerate scientific advance. Here's another example that's close to our hearts at TED, where video is sometimes more powerful than print, the sharing of an idea. Why do people like watching TED Talks? All those ideas are already out there in print. It's actually faster to read than to view. Why would someone bother? Well, we said there's some showing as well as telling. But even leaving the screen out of it, there's still a lot more being transferred than just words. And it's in that nonverbal portion. There's some serious magic. Somewhere hidden in the physical gestures, the vocal cadence, the facial expressions, the eye contact, the passion, the kind of awkward British body language, <laughs> the, the, uh, you know, the sense of how the audience are reacting. That there are hundreds of subconscious clues that go to how well you will understand and whether you are inspired. Light, if you like, and desire. Incredibly, all of this can be communicated on just a few square inches of a screen. Reading and writing are actually relatively recent inventions. Face-to-face -face communication has been fine-tuned by millions of years of evolution. That's what's made it into this mysterious, powerful thing it is. Someone speaks, there's resonance in all these receding brains. The whole group acts together. I mean, this is the connective tissue of the human superorganism in action. It's probably driven our culture for millennia. 500 years ago, it ran into a competitor with a lethal advantage. It's right here. Print scaled. The world's ambitious innovators and influencers now could get their ideas to spread far and wide. And so, you know, the art of the spoken word pretty much withered on the vine. But now, in the blink of an eye, the game has changed again. It's not too much to say that what Gutenberg did for writing, online video can now do for face-to-face -face communication. So that primal medium, which your brain is exquisitely wired for, that just went global. Now, this is big. <laughs> we, we may have to reinvent an ancient art form. I mean, today, one person speaking can be seen by millions shedding bright light on potent ideas, creating intense desire for learning and to respond, and in his case, intense desire to laugh. For the first time in human history, talented students don't have to have their potential and their dreams written out of history by lousy teachers. They can sit two feet in front of the world's finest. Now, Ted is just a small part of this. I mean, the world's universities are opening up their curricula. Thousands of individuals and organizations are sharing their knowledge and data online. Thousands of people are figuring out new ways to learn and, crucially, to respond, completing the cycle. And so, as we've thought about this, you know, it's become clear to us what the next stage of TED's evolution has to be. TED Talks can't be a, a one-way process, one to many. Our future is many to many. So we're dreaming of ways to make it easier for you, the global TED community, to respond to speakers, to contribute your own ideas, maybe even your own TED Talks. 
and to help shine a light on the very best of what's out there. Because if we can bubble up the very best from a vastly larger pool, this wheel turns. Now, is it possible to imagine a similar process to this happening to global education overall? I mean, does it have to be this painful, top-down process? Why, why not a self-fueling cycle in which we all can participate? It's the participation age, right? Schools can't be silos. We, we can't stop learning, age 21. What if, in the coming crowd of 9 billion, what if that crowd could learn enough to be net contributors instead of net plunderers? That changes everything, right? I mean, that would take more teachers than we've ever had. But the good news is, they are out there. They're in the crowd, and the crowd is switching on lights, and we can see them for the first time, not as an undifferentiated mass of strangers, but as individuals we can learn from. Who's the teacher? You're the teacher. You're part of the crowd that may be about to launch the biggest learning cycle in human history. This 它比透过文字去翻译来得更简单以及更容易理解. A cycle capable of carrying all of us to a smarter, wiser, more beautiful place. Here's a group of kids in a village in Pakistan near where I grew up. Within five years, each of these kids is going to have access to a cell phone capable of full-on web video and capable of uploading video to the web. I mean, is it crazy to think that this girl on the back at the right in 15 years might be sharing the idea that keeps the world beautiful for your grandchildren? It's not crazy. It's actually happening right now. I want to introduce you to a good friend of Ted who just happens to live in Africa's biggest shantytown. Hi, my name is Christopher Macau. I'm one of the organizers of TEDx Kibira. There are so many good things which are happening right here in Kibira. There is a self-help group they are turned a trash place into a garden. The same spot, it was a crime spot whereby people were being robbed. They are using the same trash to form green manure. The same trash site is feeding more than 30 families. We have our own film school. They are using flip cameras to record, edit, and reporting to their own channel, Kibira TV. Because of scarcity of land, we are using the sacks to grow vegetables and also able to save on the cost of living. Changes happen when we see things in a different way. Today, I see Kibira in a different way. My message to TED Global and the entire world is, Kibira is a hotbed of innovation and ideas. Mm. Mm. You know what? I bet Chris has always been an inspiring guy. What's new, and it's huge, is that for the first time, we get to see him. And, and he can see us. Right now, Chris and Kevin and Dennis and Dixon and their friends are watching us in Nairobi right now. Guys, we've learned from you today. Thank you, and thank you. <音樂>這個是一個很動人的時代所以像我們在一開始的時候跟大家分享的就是不要去浪費時間 在沒有可以學習的這個事情上面<咳>最後的一段在我跟大家問一點問題之前希望大家思考一件事情<咳> 
：如果地球是你的客户，你会怎么做？因为各位如果要做设计，我们通常都想象客户是一个人或者是一个公司。如果地球是你的客户，这里面有一句话是说 ，designers and other professionals， 就是设计师跟其他的这个专业的人士 ，need to choose to choose， 需需要去选择 what their still young professions will be about， 就是他们还年轻的这个职业要做些什么 ，creating visual lights to help sell stuff， 创造一些视觉上的谎话。去帮助人家把东西卖出去 ，or 或者是 helping repair the world， 去帮助修护这个世界 ，by 通过 bridging knowledge， 把这个知识和互相的了解连接起来。这个，如果你做了后面这件事情，那就是地球就是你的客户。你用这样子的一个。态度去想，就算是一个人来找你做你的客户，你也要想象他的后面有一个地球。那这样子，就我们在谈今天的题目，就是设计思考，他在教育上面以及在这个呃这个社会责任上面呢，我们就比较容易去了解，那那是什么意思？